Okay, it is officially 530. So we will go ahead and get started today. Aloha again, everyone. Welcome to a special presentation tonight on redefining the definition of a public aquarium and what it means to our local community by our guest presenter, Tapani Vori, General Manager of Maui Ocean Center and the founder and president of the Maui Ocean Center Marine Institute. We're all very excited that you're here. I am Jill Wirt, your MC. I am a project and research coordinator at Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Tonight's presentation is part of Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's monthly Know Your Ocean speaker series, usually held on the first Wednesday of each month at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. This monthly series is supported by the County of Maui Mayor's Office of Economic Development. A few things before we get going, you'll notice that your microphone is on mute. Please keep it on mute during the presentation to avoid any distractions. We invite you to submit any questions by using the questions button in the lower edge of your screen, and we'll leave some time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions that come up. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter. Tapani Vori is my Ocean Center's general manager and a visionary for the future of our oceans. He's charismatic, multi-passionate, and a man of his word who doesn't shy away from a challenge. Vori grew up in Finland, where he formed a powerful connection with nature and the ocean, a bond he has carried throughout his life. He got his diving license as a young child and describes with boyhood wonder his experiences diving in the winter beneath the surface of the ice. As a young adult, he moved to the US to attend college starting at Brigham Young University in Utah and graduating from UCLA in 1987. His work eventually led him to Oahu where he was living with his wife when he stumbled upon a job opening for a retail director at Maui Ocean Center's gift shop, Maui Ocean Treasures. He joined the retail team and rapidly transformed the business, fixing existing problems and setting the store up for success. In the years that followed, Vore became enamored with the wildlife under the water's surface and realized how strong his desire was to protect it. When he accepted the position as Maui Ocean Center's general manager, he had one request to build an on-property 501c3 to support conservation efforts even further. Through his efforts and vision, Vore became the founder and president of the Maui Ocean Center Marine Institute, which serves to restore Hawaii's coral reefs and rehabilitate injured Hawaiian green sea turtles. Today, Vori works from all angles to protect marine life and is deeply involved in our island community. In addition to his contribution at the Marine Institute, Vori is an active board member of the Ma'alaya Triangle Association, vice president of the Ma'alaya Village Community Association, and president of the Advisory Council for Maui County on Civil Rights. Please join me in welcoming Tapani Vori to our Zoom stage. Thank you, Jill. Uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Um, and let me start by saying it actually takes a dedicated and inspired team uh, to really accomplish a lot of positive change. Uh, uh, I may be a catalyst on some of these things, but uh, it really takes a dedicated team to uh, pull things off uh, in terms of uh, fundamental change. First of all, uh, thank you for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Um, you know, I want to recognize their role in environmental stewardship. Um, and I know we have been working <clears throat> with Maui Nui Marine Resource Council uh, on several projects together for years. And we currently have, um, with the Malaya Triangle Association, a low impact uh, developmental study where the long-term hope is to convert the entire parking lot of uh, over 800 parking uh, stalls um, to a permeable uh, parking lot surface. So we allow the uh, rainwater actually to go uh, recharge the watershed. Uh, thank you also for the uh, audience uh, taking personal time off um, to attend this uh, presentation or discussion or you know my talk. Uh, I know everybody's family time is super valuable, so thank you for that. Um, I think uh, uh, Jill covered my background actually quite well. Um, you know, I, I really don't want to add too much to it. Um, it's been a long journey. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be 
able to uh, emigrate to the United States and where these opportunities have been available. Uh, uh, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, let me talk a little bit about the Maui Ocean Center history and uh, operations. And then I can go a little bit more into detail about the um, industry and uh, issues that we are working on. So um, first of all, Maui Ocean Center is uh, part of an international company called Coral World International based out of Tel Aviv, out of Israel. The owner of the company, his name is Benjamin Khan. Uh, we have sister aquariums, uh, excuse me, one in uh, Perth, Australia, one in Eilat, Israel on the Red Sea and one in Palma de Mallorca in Spain. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be part of the opening team in Spain. And uh, we are currently actually uh, working on uh, opening an aquarium in Berlin, Germany. Uh, very exciting times because uh, Germans are super focused on environmental issues. And um, this is actually coming up in their permitting process. And um, we feel that um, we can actually operate very successfully in that kind of environment. Um, that project is actually in the process of, uh, you know, starting right now as we speak. Um, Maui Ocean Center, we've been here uh, since 1998. Uh, we are quite unique aquarium in many respects. Uh, uh, the biggest difference is really that we have an open uh, water flow system. Uh, we pump uh, seawater sea into the aquarium on a daily basis, uh, roughly about 1.2 million gallons uh, every day. Our intake is in the ocean, about 300 meters outside the breakwater here in Malaya Bay. You can actually see it if you go to uh, Google Earth, you can see the uh, pipe uh, in the ocean, a uh, faint outline of it. Uh, we filter the water a couple different ways. We have high pressure sand filters that remove all the biosolids. Uh, we also have a biological filter that we call a gravity filter. Uh, what that actually does, that uh, converts NH4, which is ammonia, to NO2 and NO3, nitrite, nitrate. And that, that, that eventually becomes nitrogen gas that's generally referred as a uh, denitrification process. Uh, then we have also a couple other polishing steps. Uh, we have protein skimmers and we have ozone generators that we polish the water. Uh, before we release it into the Malaya Harbor. Uh, the water we release into the Malaya Harbor is actually cleaner than the water uh, that currently is in the harbor or in the ocean. And uh, we've done a uh, actually scientific study with our environmental team uh, that Maui Ocean Center is clean in the Malaya Harbor water with our uh, clean effluent water. Our total nitrogen uh, levels, we are in the range of 120 micrograms per liter. Uh, just to give you an idea, the uh, drinking water standards in Hawaii are seven milligrams for TN total nitrogen. So it's uh, quite clean indeed. 9-11-2015, um, that was really the uh, second week of my position as a GM. And uh, that was really a watershed moment for me personally in many respects. Um, ocean water temperature was 85 degrees of Fahrenheit and many of us uh, on this call remember that actually quite uh, clearly, I'm sure. At that time, I remember there was a lot of uh, public uh, comments about climate change being a hoax and not really real. Uh, what happened at that time is Hawaii actually lost about 40% of our corals to coral bleaching. And as many of you know, there's actually uh, three different factors that impact coral bleaching or, or generate it. Number one, uh, the velocity or the, uh, the delta in the thermal, uh, thermal temperature, uh, basically how large that delta is uh, when that happens, the velocity of that delta, how fast it happens, and also uh, the duration of that delta, how long it actually uh, is uh, active. Uh, we were fortunate enough, some of the coral species came back, uh, some, of, some of them never came back. So um, uh, that was in the public news. We heard about it in the Hawaii and uh, actually globally. Uh, uh, Australia is probably a lot more newsworthy in many respects because everybody knows about the Great Barrier Reef. We are dealing with the same issue here. So we've been pretty fortunate. We haven't had a major bleaching event after that, but as we know uh, what is happening with the climate change 
and oceans warming, uh, this is bound to repeat itself. At that time when that happened, uh, our curator, John Gorman, uh, I told John, uh, John, we need to airlift a seawater chiller uh, and make sure that the, uh, all the uh, coral under our care. Actually, I prefer to talk about the marine life under our care because the marine life, it does not belong to us. We do not own it. Uh, we never sell or buy animals, marine life, period. Uh, what also makes us quite unique is all the live coral under our care. It's actually live uh, uh, coral polyps uh, or live rock, uh, whatever term one prefers to use. Most of the aquariums worldwide, they have a lot of fake coral and artificial coral in their displays. It is quite difficult actually to maintain successful marine uh, aquarium uh, environments uh, uh, with uh, happy, uh, thriving, uh, um, you know, uh, tropical uh, finfish and uh, coral uh, colonies. Uh, coral colonies can be quite aggressive. They are very sensitive as well. There's actually coral wars uh, happening. Uh, so you have to really know what corals can uh, thrive together, et cetera and uh, where the symbiotic relationships are with the tropical fin fish and how it works together. So as of today, we are, or since uh, 2015, we are cooling the seawater that we are uh, pumping into the aquarium. Uh, if I wanted to get a little bit uh, cheeky with everyone, I could say that we're, all, we're cooling the ocean water. Uh, not really, because our interest is to keep that thermal mass inside our live coral exhibit building, uh, which we refer as building A or living reef building. And then we'll circulate it around uh, the aquarium as well. Most of the people, uh, it's been my experience early on, I, I, I learned that uh, most people coming to uh, Maui Ocean Center and visiting us, uh, uh, they think uh, coral is a rock, and that really started uh, thinking uh, or helped me, you know, open uh, that uh, topic a little bit more. And I started thinking about it. Uh, what do we really need to do here to really uh, show the beauty underneath the ocean surface? Um, you know, at that time, uh, I heard Sylvia Earle on the public radio uh, one day when I was coming to work, and. Um, she said something that really further galvanized me on this, uh, on our mission and our vision. She said that uh, she fears that the oceans are doomed. And she, uh, she was saying that the reason for this is the disconnect between the beauty underneath the ocean surface and uh, public perception of the ocean resources. Uh, she said that uh, she fears that that will not change until people really remove that disconnect. So how do we change that perception? How do we help uh, the public to realize the beauty underneath the ocean surface? So, so one thing right away, what we started doing here at the Ocean Center, we actually started showing and allowing people to uh, feed coral under a microscope. And uh, we uh, actually show, show it in a large digital screen while that is happening. Uh, when I personally saw it the first time, it really blew my mind uh, how beautiful it was. And uh, I decided that we have to uh, somehow figure out how we can share this with the public. Um, um, you know, in general, um, there are people uh, in the public um, who really uh, have a uh, deeply held uh, belief that uh, aquariums and uh, zoos uh, should not exist, uh, that, um, you know, we are really animal prisons. Um, and I can certainly respect that uh, viewpoint. Um, um, let me start by sh sharing first uh, some of the things, uh, additional things that uh, what we are doing really, uh, what I, I believe makes us quite unique. Um, number one, uh, Uncle Charlie, um, who was a preeminent uh, cultural authority here in Maui, uh, he was here at the beginning and uh, he really wanted to make sure that the uh, mano, or the sharks, uh, especially that um, we had under our care that they're well taken care of and respected. Um, his grandson, uh, Dane Maxwell is now our cultural uh, advisor and director. 
making sure that we are always doing the right thing by the Hawaiian cultural perspective. And my instructions to um, Dane, Dane has been really hold us accountable to your standards and what your expectations are, you know, uh, because fundamentally we need to respect the uh, sense of place and the uh, respect for host culture. Uh, I shared with Dane that I, I'm hopeful that one day his uh, daughters uh, will become our cultural advisors. So, so it's really a long-term vision, you know, uh, what we are really uh, looking at and how we are working on. So um, we really uh, have incorporated the respect for the local host culture, uh, Dane, uh, Uncle Charlie first, and now Dane, uh, whenever, uh, you know, we may do a, uh, we are able to collect a shark and um, bring it in um, for temporary stay here. Uh, most of the animals, larger animals especially, they usually stay less than two years uh, under our care here. And a large majority of the animals under our care, we return back into the same spot uh, where we collected them. Uh, we operate under SAP permit, which is the state of Hawaii issued collection permit. Uh, we do very little uh, collections nowadays. So obviously we do not have that much need anymore. Uh, we are actually working actively with uh, Oceanic Institute and University of Hawaii Hilo, uh, which probably is the preeminent uh, marine science program, uh, education program here in Hawaii. Uh, we are now providing fish eggs for them to aquaculture uh, species uh, uh, here in Hawaii. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit further uh, later. Um, so we are doing all these things, uh, plus the education is really close to what we are doing. Uh, I used to be a public school teacher back in the old country. So Kids are really close uh, to my heart. Um, I always enjoy dealing with uh, children. Many times it's the older individuals that have a hard time uh, changing their belief system, um, you know, like me perhaps. So, and, um, you know, it's super important that uh, we share this uh, information and uh, inspiration most in, in, uh, importantly with the kids. Um, and uh, with the demographic change that uh, we all see happening, uh, this is what the younger generation is really passionate about uh, because ultimately they will inherit all this and they have to deal with these issues. Um, we actually operate under a NIPDES permit uh, in regards to our water quality. Uh, right away when I came here, I noticed uh, uh, we had some challenges with our water quality uh, standards. Um, uh, I hired an environmental team. Uh, many of you know Robin Knox, who is a preeminent water quality regulatory and policy expert in the United States. She regularly uh, gives uh, talks at the U.S. Water Federation. She also consults to uh, University, uh, the state, state of Hawaii Department of Health. Also, our, we hired a technical director, Aviat Kahana, who is a chemical engineer by training. Uh, he used to work with the uh, British Petroleum when the Deepwater Horizon uh, was happening in, uh, in the Gulf of uh, uh, Caribbean, and uh, he was their environmental medication officer. We are very fortunate to have both of these individuals living here on Maui. And... Um, we started this journey uh, with the uh, Department of Health, with Bruce Anderson, who was the director at that time. And uh, we were able to actually improve our system here. We optimized uh, pretty much everything. And we uh, provided, we did a lot of uh, mass flow balance analysis in our system and uh, data calculations. And we proved scientifically, which is actually public uh, data. It's available uh, publicly from the state of Hawaii. Be happy to share it to anyone who may have interest in seeing that. Um, and um, when we started uh, the conversations uh, or the dialogue with the Department of Health, uh, my instructions to our team was that we need to go to DOH, uh, uh, sharing with them uh, highlighting what we think is the problem in terms of water quality issues in the Bay and uh, how it impacts our operational capability and uh, share the data that we have actually uh, been able to calculate and, uh, and double check. 
And then uh, also, most importantly, I shared with the team that when we go there, we need to be able to uh, uh, tell, which we did uh, to the Department of Health, that uh, we want to be part of the solution and we want to have skin in the game. In other words, we are ready and able to put money on the table. So we are part of the solution and we want to work with you. They were actually uh, super in, excited about this because uh, they said normally uh, this has not really happened. So this is quite a unique approach. And uh, they were very uh, constructive to work with. Um, and um, uh, obviously we wanted to make sure everything is done uh, transparently and by the book, uh, which I believe it was uh, the whole process. And uh, we are successfully operating under the current NIPTES permit under the Clean Water Act of 1972. The bigger problem that we have here in Malaya community, uh, if you look at Google Earth, you can see Malaya Bay. The entire bay is classified as 303D classification, which means impaired body of water. We have quite a lot of them in the state of Hawaii. Um, that is actually a shock for a lot of people. Uh, there is basically two reasons for that. Uh, number one, uh, environmental threat to uh, near shore marine ecosystems is sedimentation. And uh, for example, anecdotally, uh, two weeks ago when we had the large rain here on Maui, you could actually see the brown water going almost all the way to Kaholawe. So that's actually quite far distance. Second uh, very important point is actually excessive nutrients. And um, uh, because we have the, we operate under NIPTES permit, uh, we have a requirement to do a water quality testing every month. We also have a zone of mixing, uh, ZOM, uh, Z-O-M, that we are required to do twice a year. And um, it's very clear to us uh, how, how high the nutrient limits are in the harbor and uh, in the zone of mixing. And uh, so we have this data and we have seen that. State of Hawaii, the LNR, DAR also has done a study uh, where they looked at the coral reef ecosystem around uh, Hawaii and here Maui specifically when they did that. Uh, there was a previous study done about I believe 20 years ago or so and um, at that time uh, coral reef ecosystem coverage in the bay was about 75% uh, or so when they did this study uh, uh, 2006 I believe uh, it was about 8%. As of today, we would estimate it's probably somewhere around 5%. So um, this is happening under our watch. So question really that I have to all of us is, what is it that we are doing about this? Other big issue that uh, we see actually happening here in the on Maui and statewide actually, um, there's an organization called Limo High. They're an organization here in Hawaii that uh, focuses on Limo, which is the Hawaiian word for seaweed. Uh, and the number of arrows here in Maui and Uncle Wally Ito in uh, Honolulu or Oahu. They are really the key people that I've been talking. Uh, they both have shared with us that uh, 100 years ago, there used to be more than 125 different species of limo. As of today, maybe 12, 15. And um, again, just yesterday, I spoke with somebody who grew up on Maui and they remember picking uh, Limo and Kihei uh, with their grandma, and they don't do that anymore, obviously, because you can hardly find Limo uh, around the Maui waters anymore or statewide. Uh, it's very becoming quite difficult. So the urgency has really, um, in my mind, come forward. And uh, many times when people look at environmental issues, one thing that I see happening, uh, when I look at issues globally, um, you know, um, I see things uh, accelerating and it's not a linear change that is happening in terms of um, you know, climate change. So um, I think it's super important for all of us to understand the urgency of this matter. And um, sometimes I feel that I'm uh, almost uh, preaching uh, to people about this. So I apologize for that, uh, for those who may may feel that way, but uh, this is how serious this issue is, in my opinion. Um, uh, going back to Maui Ocean Center, uh, the fundamental guiding principle here is that, which I share with every single uh, team member who is here, 
we need to add value to our local community. Uh, I do not want us to be in hokey, one-dimensional entertainment business. For that, we can uh, I can go to mainland, or for those who want to be in that in that business, they can do that. Um, to me personally, it's um, much too much important, uh, too much importance to. Uh, us doing that because if it's not us who is actually sharing the importance of this uh, uh, environmental change and climate change that is happening and conservation issues, then who will do that? And uh, it is my hope that uh, whatever we are doing here within the confines of Maui Ocean Center, uh, it inspires people uh, to take it wherever they came from, wherever their homes are, whether it's in uh, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, or New York, or in Europe, or Asia, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, all of us are connected, uh, and we all need to really take the viewpoint that this is, you know, holistic issue. You know, we can, I would argue robustly that we cannot look at these individual issues uh, in isolation of each other's, because then we objectify them and, uh, it's too easy just to do one thing. Uh, we really need to do the hard thing and hard work here to really look at things from a macro perspective. And that's why I appreciate, uh, you know, uh, really organizations like Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, because they are really understanding the importance of this uh, uh, entire macro view to me, uh, which is important. Um, when we, um, we're working on the water quality. Early on, we realized that uh, we were actually doing testing on the mainland. Uh, so we had to put a stop to that right away because those of you in the audience who have done any water testing, quality testing, you understand that 12 times, you know, you have limited window opportunity there to make sure that the samples do not uh, erode the sample quality period. So we started working with the water quality lab, testing lab on uh, Oahu. And at the same time, in parallel, we uh, took it upon uh, initiating a conversation with the chancellor at the University of Hawaii uh, Maui campus, uh, Chancellor Louis um, Okana. And uh, we proposed to a UH uh, MC that uh, since you have a laboratory, uh, why don't you look at setting up a, uh, seawater quality, uh, testing quality, uh, you know, ability in the test. Uh, and we can advise you on the type of equipment uh, needed. Uh, they were uh, quite receptive to that idea and the people on their lab and uh, water quality team uh, were quite excited about it. Um, we are now in the final stages of it and uh, that probably will uh, become uh, uh, news here pretty soon. I would imagine uh, within uh, hopefully Q1 here, quarter one. Um, and the whole value with this is that now we have water quality testing capability, including seawater here on Maui. And most importantly, uh, UHMC has an ability to set up an accredited curriculum program for our local children who are interested in STEM-based uh, career choices. And from my experience, um, you know, we were spending uh, almost 100,000 a year for water quality testing in this process. And it's not as high as of today, but uh, it's substantial amount. So I personally rather keep that money here on Maui and give it to UH who can again have, have positive cash flow on this program and create a accredited uh, water quality testing program and, uh, and uh, educate local kids in this field. Uh, and it's actually quite a well compensated field. So not everyone necessarily wants to be in hospitality or tourism related industries like uh, I am um, or in the aquarium industry as per se. Um, so uh, we are look I'm hopeful that uh, that will come into fruition uh, here early, uh, pretty soon. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> The issue that um, we have about the industry that I uh, pointed out earlier, what I mean, you know, there are some people who believe that we should shut down our operations. Uh, we see a lot of student groups here. I personally make a point that I talk to all the student groups who come here, whether they're from Hawaii or the mainland, I really don't care. Because to, to me, it's super important that we try to inspire the kids about the uh, 
issues that are going to be uh, impacting their futures. Um, Early on, or probably a year and a half before we shut down for COVID, uh, I sat down with uh, Chan Corman, who was the curator at that time, and I told Chan, we need to do better what we are doing. Besides all the things that I have shared with the audience this evening, uh, what I think makes us quite unique, um, uh, I think there is still room for us to hold us ourselves accountable and do even better. So we made a public commitment that the, by the end of the 2020, 20% uh, 20 of the marine life under our care, it would actually be from a sustainable supply chain. What I mean by that is about four or five years ago, if I remember correctly, there's a scientist named Dr. Chatham Callum out of Oceanic Institute. He was the first scientist in the world to aquaculture yellow tang in captivity, which is super hard to do. And, and yellow tang is a keystone uh, uh, species. Uh, I'm sure many of us have seen the negative news stories uh, uh, about the um, um, aquarium collection uh, issues and the yellow tanks specifically. Uh, Big Island had a uh, broad problem with them uh, being discarded in the harbor uh, on the um, on the on the parking lot there and. Um, so how do we address the larger fundamental problem of our industry so. Um, uh, I told, uh, or we actually agreed with John that uh, we would agree that by the end of 2020, 15% 15, 15 uh, of the, I'm sorry, 20% of the animals under our care, they would come from a sustainable su supply chain. We provided uh, some funding for Oceanic Institute as they lost uh, majority of their funding with Senator Inouye's passing. And uh, we should be doing a little bit more, and uh, I will uh, revisit that uh, this quarter as well. And uh, we have actually Yellow Tank from Oceanic Institute here uh, on display, and where we are sharing that story. Unfortunately, we did not quite uh, meet our goal, and uh, so we failed our effort uh, in that respect, but we are not giving up, so we will continue to push that forward. Like I mentioned earlier, we're now providing fish eggs for Oceanic Institute and um, University of Hawaii Hilo. So we are hoping that that will actually multiply the availability for uh, aquaculture species as well. Um, this can have a larger uh, global impact. Imagine if all the aquariums, not only in the United States, but uh, globally make a similar commitment and not only 20%, but 40, 60, or even 80%. What would happen in the natural resources? Uh, many of us are familiar with Papahana Mokuakea, Northwestern Hawaiian uh, Islands, uh, which is an MPA, Marine Protected Area. And uh, their boundary is about 160 miles around the archipelago. And uh, we've all seen the data and heard the anecdotal stories how the marine life and the marine resources have bounced back. Um, closer here in home, uh, on Maui, um, Ahihikina, excuse me, uh, in South Maui, uh, as soon as we removed ourselves from the area, uh, wildlife, uh, natural life, marine, li uh, marine life uh, bounced back and uh, it's in abundance there. So there has to be a balance. Obviously, we cannot ban everything. So we need to find that balance, uh, what, whatever that may be. So those are the larger policy questions and discussions that we as a community need to have with our leaders at the political uh, segment and uh, really think what is sustainable and um, you know, uh, how do we manage our communities, our home. Um, and to me, this is a quite important issue. Uh, this is a, another reason that uh, I'm also quite active with the Malaya Village Association, which is the local community association. Um, not sure if many of the audience uh, knows that all the condominiums we have here in Malaya Bay, they are not connected to Maui wastewater infrastructure. They all have uh, individual injection wells that on average are about 40 to 60 feet in depth. So after rudimentary primary bacterial treatment, uh, the effluent goes into injection wells. And as we all know, we are sitting on basaltic rock. 
and uh, we we do see uh, this impact in the ocean in the data that we are collecting in water quality. Um, Lahaina injection well case, uh, also another demonstration, and uh, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council has done a lot of work uh, on the water quality issues on uh, E. coli and enterococci uh, readings, and uh, we all see what the numbers are uh, in uh, South Maui as well, unfortunately. So again, here we are looking at the entire watershed and how we can restore the watershed. Um, when we were closed for 306 days uh, with the COVID, uh, I was the hands-on operations manager. Uh, I was fortunate enough to attend a chief engineer conference in South Maui, where all the, all the hotel chief engineers were there. And uh, number one concern there was um, shoreline erosion. Everybody was talking that we need to build larger concrete walls uh, uh, block the uh, seawater coming into our properties and eroding our beach. And finally, I had to stand up and uh, just say, hey, look, everyone, uh, we are looking at the wrong direction. We need to turn 180 degrees. We need to look at the entire Aupoa, which is, let's look at the mountain. Let's, let's fix the watershed. Uh, once we do that, um, uh, near shore marine ecosystems, uh, they have a chance of coming back to life because we are removing sedimentation uh, and uh, we are addressing a lot of nutrient issues. So uh, fringing coral reefs actually have a super important function uh, in the near shore marine ecosystem. They absorb a lot of kinetic energy and this is our first line of defense for a lot of these issues. Our communities are uh, in whether in West Maui, Kanaha or uh, now in South Maui, some areas, and uh, I know for the fact here in Malaya, we are looking, some of the condominiums are really uh, uh, desperate on dealing with this issue. So we really need to have a larger solution that is more holistic uh, so solution to it. Um, let me talk a little bit about the sense of place. So it's important that we show the respect for the uh, host culture uh, because we are here really um, uh, in the community that uh, has been here for some time. And I want to make sure that we are respectful to that. And, um, you know, many times uh, the beneficiaries of Western education system like myself, uh, uh, our, um, you know, uh, sometimes our education tends to be a little bit myopic. So, it's important that we hear these diverse indigenous voices and viewpoints and respect them because uh, not only always technological answers are the only answers. So we have to be open and receptive to hearing these voices. Let me illustrate that a little bit. When we did the humpback uh, whale exhibit here uh, with the holographic whale uh, uh, experience movie, uh, we hired an exhibit designer and I told Chris, who was the designer at that time uh, for that project, I said, Chris, uh, I will make your job uh, difficult because there's three things that I will ask you to do. Number one, uh, we will have community stakeholder meetings and we will ask community how they like our conceptual design. Number two, I want you to uh, design uh, layers into this exhibit and this experience. So. Uh, if people, if person comes here only once, then that means I have failed as a general manager. We want people to come here multiple times and every time they come, they actually peel off additional layers and they learn something uh, new. And the third one, I told him, I want you to uh, question our preconceived notions, like I mentioned earlier, what we think we know. Uh, on that note, uh, I don't know how many of you have read Kumolipo. That's the Hawaiian or uh, creation of origin story. Uh, here we have an indigenous culture who actually basically had an evolutionary theory uh, in place. Uh, the only challenge that they had, uh, Hawaiian community, they chanted this uh, because they did not uh, have the written uh, uh, language available there under, un, until the missionaries uh, introduced that uh, to the community. And uh, we think it was actually Charles Darwin in 1840 who actually wrote the evolutionary theory. So. 
uh, all I'm saying is that we should really be open and receptive to evaluating, uh, you know, the indigenous uh, viewpoints many times. And one more thing that I want to point out to that is many times uh, uh, we have a tendency in popular culture to objectify things. And uh, this is very clear in sharks. This is why we really wanted to do a shark finning exhibit that is now up and operational. Uh, when Joss, the movie came out, I'm sure all of us have seen it, it really did a huge disservice to sharks because it objectified the sharks and uh, by doing that, it provided a tacit approval to kill them. And um, harvest, uh, we, the shark finning harvesting is continuing unabated. And uh, we all see unabated uh, in uh, media the uh, sensationalism of sharks. And every time we see pictures and videos of sharks, it's always about how menacing and dangerous they are. And uh, it's actually uh, the opposite in many ways. Uh, if we eliminate them, uh, uh, we really have something to fear if the oceans uh, do not have any more sharks. Um, let me talk a little bit about our nonprofit, um, you know, um, like Jill was uh, highlighting earlier. This was super important because I always felt that uh, we as a for-profit operation did not have ability uh, to uh, really do a lot of this altruistic uh, community-driven work that uh, really needs to happen here. I'm ultimately responsible for the entire consolidated P&L profit and loss statement and ensure that we are making profit uh, because if we are not profitable, we cannot remain in business. I would also argue publicly that uh, environmental stewardship, conservation stewardship is uh, um, actually um, synonymous to making, having ability to make uh, profit or they're not mutually exclusive. We can accomplish both of them at the same time. Maui Ocean Center Marine Institute is based on three foundational pillars. Number one, uh, Turtle Hospital and Turtle Rescue and Rehab Center. We are the only turtle rehab center in the entire state of Hawaii right now. Uh, federal government is actually airlifting uh, injured sea turtles to us uh, pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, last year, we saw almost 300 sea turtles that we rehabbed. Uh, hopefully, they'll get to open their Four Island facility um, soon. Um, we are part of their fail-safe program, uh, on, on, so we are the location on Maui. With the state of Hawaii, we operate the Coral Nursery, so this is a fail-safe program. Under our safekeeping, we have rare Hawaiian endemic corals, so we have ability to fast grow coral. By this, I mean we are able to grow 10 centimeters per year versus the normal growth rate, about one centimeter a year. Uh, through micro fragmentation mostly and making sure they have proper right nutrients. Um, third foundational pillar, uh, educational outreach and making sure that, uh, uh, you know, uh, these environmental issues are, and marine science is part of the educational curriculum and more exposed. So, uh, so far we are doing a lot of work. We are actually hoping to start a capital fundraising campaign for a larger facility here in Malaya uh, to do that. And uh, that would also have us ability to house uh, dormitories uh, and meeting room for scientists and uh, be able to bring in uh, more nonprofits to work out of that space as well. Uh, stay tuned for the news on that. Uh, we are not ready to publish. Uh, we are still doing our due diligence on the foundational work on that. And lastly, before I need to uh, close my discussion here is um, I, um, I would argue that we as a community, we need to seriously talk about our tourism, what is sustainable. And um, one of my personal heroes is uh, Tommy Remen Gesal Jr., who was the president of Palau until February 18th, uh, 2021. Here we have a political leader who single-handedly changed the entire nation state to a, to a eco-friendly, uh, sustainable uh, economic model. And people are better off there, people are happier, and uh, this will actually sustain uh, the nation state for future generations. Certainly if a third world nations, as we many times call these specific nations, can accomplish something like that, 
why would we not be able to accomplish that as being part of the richest nation uh, on earth? So I would challenge everyone on this call to really um, look at that larger issue and how do we regulate tourism uh, and uh, what is sustainable? I would argue that 2019, uh, Ma uh, excuse me, Maui, when we had two and a half million tourists and when Hawaii had 10 and a half million, that was too much. And this may sound contradictory coming from a, a person who is running number one attraction here on Maui. But anyway, it's time for me to close and I'll uh, open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Tupani. Wow. I, I mean, it is so evident that Maui Ocean Center is so, is so committed and involved in the community. You have your hands in so many different projects. So we just really appreciate um, everything that you're doing. And it was great to hear your perspective and um, all of your insight onto some of these issues that are happening here on Maui. We do have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, feel free to submit them in the question feature on your Zoom screen and I'll um, read them out. If you are joining this presentation from Facebook Live, please submit your question as a comment and then it'll be relayed to us here. I am not seeing any questions in the Q&A right now, but I did have some of my own. So I'll go ahead and ask mine um, while I give some people time to think. Um, I was curious with the topic of Limu and how much it's declined, has Maui Ocean Center thought about growing or creating a Limu type exhibit? Um, I'm glad you asked. Uh, yes, we have. Uh, We're not there yet. Um, and uh, what really prompted this idea uh, when I um, met with uh, Andy uh, Napua Barros, um, she actually did a limo restoration project in Waihe River in um, Waihe. And uh, it uh, actually was becoming very successful. And then all of a sudden, uh, people started picking limo. Unfortunately, they picked limo the wrong way and they did not pick the tips of the limo. So right away, uh, I was thinking that, uh, and I shared this with uh, Antti, that uh, we need to start educating people. Uh, let me start thinking about how we can do a limo exhibit. We have now identified an area uh, here in Saitia Corning where we can do a limo exhibit uh, um, for somebody coming perhaps from the mainland or from overseas may not see this very exciting, but I'm quite sure that everyone here in Hawaii uh, we'll be very accelerated by this when we are able to pull it off. I'm uh, pretty excited about it. I am also very excited about it. I That is great to hear, and I'm really excited to see where it goes and how it progresses. That's awesome. Um, we have one question from Ellen. Could you elaborate on environmental parking lot structural changes? So I think she's referring to the LID project we have. Um, that's correct, yeah. So um, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council actually was able to secure uh, grant funding from Maui OED, uh, Office of Economic uh, Development. Um, and they hired Michael Reyes uh, as an environmental consultant. Um, so he put a working group together. Uh, part of that group is of course, um, uh, MN MRC and uh, Maui Ocean Center is represented, uh, like is uh, Pacific Well Foundation as well. And uh, we have had a couple meetings so far. The process just started. Uh, we are now uh, installing, going to be installing uh, data lockers on the weather patterns uh, that will be actually posted on the internet. Uh, uh, location will be here in the Ma uh, Malaya, Maui Ocean Center area. And uh, once the paper is published and uh, vetted and submitted to the county, I'm personally hopeful that there will be additional funding available to actually do the project. Um, and um, I believe that all the stakeholders in the community, including uh, Malaya Triangle Association, Maui Ocean Center, and I would hope that Malaya Village Association also would support this. I believe they will. And, um, you know, um, uh, also financially, and uh, hopefully there's some funding available from the, um, from the Maui County. 
and maybe with the state. Uh, it's going to probably cost uh, several hundred thousand dollars to do this project. Uh, uh, and majority of the cost has to be borne by the beneficiaries here in the area, whose property that is, I believe. But to me, this can be an amazing uh, demonstration project on Maui and statewide when we have public-private stakeholders working together and actually coming together in an inclusive manner and they provide a solution that can be emulated elsewhere. Wonderful. Thank you for um, elaborating on that more. Um, there's another one here. Are there any plans to put critter cams in the aquarium? Maybe for um, like a live feed type of thing. That's how I'm understanding it. Um, as of today, we have two webcams. Uh, uh, we have one in the pelagic that shows the pelagic tank. Uh, so people can actually access it from our site. Uh, a lot of people are also super excited about the webcam that is pointing out to Malaya Bay. For those of you who are into surfing, you can actually see the freight trains there. And when the conditions are right, you know uh, when to come over here. And uh, you can also see the sedimentation impact uh, through that uh, webcam uh, as you can control it and you can uh, zoom and you can pivot it. So this is available for the public. Wonderful. And where can people find out more about Maui Ocean Center and Maui Marine, the Marine Institute? Where can they, um, you know, if there's volunteer opportunities, where can they go to get involved? Maui Ocean Center cannot accept volunteers because, like I mentioned, we are for profit. Uh, that would be a problem for IRS. We would have to classify them as employees. And uh, like I mentioned, we have, we have a pretty tight labor model here, and uh, PNL uh, is pretty uh, um, uh, driven by the PNL control. So, um, however, the real opportunities are with MOCMI, uh, the nonprofit. Uh, this was another reason why it was super important to have this, so we can get community uh, involved. Uh, if you go to if you Google MOCMI, it comes right up. Uh, it's the first one or you can type in uh, mocmarineinstitute.org. Uh, you can find it there, sign up there for volunteer opportunities or internships. So uh, there's plenty of opportunities here with turtle rescue or turtle uh, nest uh, card uh, duties uh, when that happens. So uh, a lot of beach cleanups, et cetera, but uh, we're doing a lot of heavy lifting and also the coral will become uh, one of the options available. Uh, there's a lot of cleanup and restoration work with coral that uh, for those who are inclined to do can do so. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. We'll go ahead and start wrapping up here again. Thank you, Tapani, for your presentation and all of the great work that you're doing on behalf of our community here and, of course, the marine environment. And to our audience, thank you for attending Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's Know Your Ocean Speaker Series sponsored by the County of Maui Office of Economic Development. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council is a nonprofit celebrating 14 years of working for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundance of native fish for the islands of Maui Nui. Our next Know Your Ocean Speaker Series event will take place on Wednesday, February 2nd at 5.30 p.m. on Zoom. I'm very excited for this one. Um, our speaker will be Dr. Jennifer M. Lynch, the co-director of the Hawaii Pacific University Center for Marine Debris Research. She'll be speaking on the topic of, did Maui's expanded polystyrene ban improve the amounts or types of plastic on Maui beaches? To hear about um, signing up for this talk and to learn about other future presentations, you can sign up for our free e-newsletter, Reef and Brief, at MauiReefs.org. And speaking of laws that impact our reefs and beaches, as you've probably heard, Maui County's ban on plastic disposable foodware was moved from January 1st of this year to March 1st, 2022. But if you love the ocean, why wait? You can get a free Hui Zero stainless steel bento box to use for your leftovers and takeout foods from your favorite eateries when you visit MauiReefs.org and donate $50. When you donate to MNMRC, 
You'll be supporting our work to improve the ocean water quality in Ma'alaya Bay. Our projects include our oyster bioremediation project, which now has thousands of caged oysters in the bay, filtering sediment and other pollutants out of the water. We're also stabilizing the slopes of Pohakea watershed to prevent sediment runoff by planting vetiver grass, as you can see on the slide here. It's a non-spreading, deep-rooted, drought and fire-resistant plant that keeps soil from washing into the ocean during rainstorms. We're going to have a few volunteer planting days coming up. So if you'd like to volunteer and help with that planting, you can send us an email, info at mauireefs.org. We're measuring the impacts of our work through ocean water quality monitoring and also monitoring runoff from the watershed at streams and erosional hotspots. Our staff and volunteers are looking forward to a very special anniversary next month, the 100th sampling session of our Hui Okavaiola Water Quality Monitoring Program. This community-based water quality monitoring program launched and conducted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, the Nature Conservancy, and West Maui Ridge to Reefs Initiative in partnership with the State of Hawaii Department of Health Clean Water Branch, tests ocean water quality every three weeks at 29 locations in South and West Maui. So that's 17 sampling sessions every year at all of our sites. We're now approaching our 100th sampling session and are excited about celebrating it with our community and the dozens of volunteers who have made this work possible. Now, if we were in person, I would ask for a show of hands from our audience to see how many of you were impacted by the flooding that occurred in North Kihei last month. I'm sure a lot of you, or at least some of you were. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council is proud to be launching work on our project to conduct site assessments and planning to address the recurring coastal flooding that's taking place in the gulches of Kulani Hakoi, Waipuilani, and Keokea, which are responsible for most of Kihei's stormwater flooding. We'll be working with the community and stakeholders to conduct site assessments and planning of proposed nature-based solutions to address this flooding. This work was made possible with a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and NOAA's National Coastal Resilience Fund. If you've missed some or all of tonight's presentation, you'll be able to view it on Facebook Live on our Maui Nui Marine Resource Council Facebook page. It will also be posted on our YouTube channel, Maui Reefs. And thanks to our good friend, Darla Palmer Ellingson, you'll be able to hear interviews with our presenters on her program, Island Environment 360 on H Hawaii media stations on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. And last but not least, we want to thank all of our sponsors and supporters who are making our work possible. And we also, also wish to thank individual donors like you. Mahalo for making a difference. Thank you all for joining us again and have a very wonderful evening. Thank you everyone. And thank you Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Thank you, Tapani. Aloha. Aloha.